O Holy Spirit, guide me to preach the Word of God truthfully and clearly and give us spiritual insight on the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, our Savior. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Romans 6, 10 eh? says, Jesus died to sin once for all. So what is the implication of this Bible verse? The writer Paul tells us that Jesus did not die for his own sin because Jesus is without sin. Jesus has never sinned. In Hebrew 4, 15, eh? it says, we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Jesus was without sin. Jesus died to pay for the sins of all those who trust in him. He died once for all. And Hebrew chapter 9, eh, verse 26, 28 says, But now he, Jesus, has appeared once for all, at the end of ages, to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. It was a one-time payment by Jesus for the sins of others, right? including past, present, and future sin. Right? So Jesus died for our sins, including our past sins, our present sins and future sins. It was a one-time payment by Jesus for the sins of others, right? Including past, present and future sins. Eh? Christ does not need to go back to the cross every time someone sins, right? He has finished the job of dying for humanity once for all, and it's over. Now, Hebrew 10, verse 10 says, And by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Right. Now, God's plan was always to use the Old Testament animal sacrifice as a temporary measure pointing towards the eventual ministry of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Right? So the animal sacrifice in the Old Testament was just temporarily. An animal sacrifice could never fully cleanse man from sin, nor could they change us from the inside. Right? From the inside. Right? So Psalm 40 6 to 8 shows how God's intent for us right, involves a physical body, not offering. Okay. The new covenant which God promised to human humanity was to be in each person's heart and mind, as mentioned in Hebrew chapter 8, verses 7 to 13. Right? So our justification, right? Okay. Or rather, the animal blood eh, was only able to atone for ceremonial issues, ceremonial purposes, not to solve our deepest problem of sin. And Jesus' sacrifice, on the other hand, obtains what animal blood could never achieve. So, instead of being offered over and over again, Jesus was sacrificed once for all. If animal sacrifice could have obtained our salvation, there would have been no need to repeat the animal sacrifice. Right? The fact that priests offer the same sacrifice over and over was proof that God never intend for animal sacrifice to fully pay 
for human sins. And our justifications come only by the blood of Christ, not by the sacrifice of animal. The justification means that our past, present and future sins are transferred to Jesus and as a result become righteous before God the Father. And it is this justification due to Jesus that give, gives us salvation from eternal punishment in hell for unforgiven sin. Now, for justification by the blood of Jesus to happen, uh, certain conditions must be fulfilled. The person must admit that he is sinful, he must repent of his sin, and that is making a commitment not to commit the same sin. Right? Secondly, the person must believe Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross for the sin of humanity and that Jesus rose from the dead on the third day. And thirdly, the person must trust Jesus fully as his Saviour and Master of his life, obeying the teaching of Jesus and the commandments and instruction of God. Then the person must be baptised in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as commissioned by Jesus. Eh? So if you believe in Jesus as your Saviour and trust Him to be the master of your life, your past, present and future sins are forgiven and you have salvation, eternal life. If your unbelieving spouse, family members or friend, they decide to, treat, to turn to Jesus, right, to believe in Jesus as his or her saviour and to trust in Jesus as his or her master of his or her life, his or her past, present and future sins are forgiven and he or she has salvation. Now, what happened? This is a question that we can ask, right? What happens if I sin and then I die before I have an opportunity to confess that sin to God. Will God punish me by sending me to hell? Or what happens if I commit a sin but then forget about it and never remember to confess it to God? So do I lose my salvation? Right? Okay. Both of these questions rest on a faulty assumption. Now, salvation is not based on whether a Christian has confessed and repent of every sin. Yeah. Right. Salvation is not based on whether a Christian right, has confessed and repent of every sin. Right. Yes, we should confess our sin as soon as we, you know, uh, are aware that we have sinned. While sin in the life of believers in Jesus right, does not stand the perfect coating of Jesus' forgiveness on our life, but it does get in the way of our relationship with God and our ability to reflect His perfect character. So confession is a process that God used to cut the sin out of our lives and to refine our character to be more Christ-like. So in confession, right, we align right, our attention to God right, and submit to the Holy Spirit guidance for our next steps in our life. Dr. Bill Bright that refers to confession as spiritual breathing. We exhale, we breathe out the guilt of our sin through confession. And then we inhale, breathe in the power of the Holy Spirit by depending on the leading of the Holy Spirit. Okay. John 1 John 1 9 says, uh, If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins 
and purify us from all unrighteousness. When we confess our sin to God, then we are agreeing with God that we are wrong, that we have sinned. God forgive us through confession on an ongoing basis because He is faithful and just. God is faithful by forgiving sins which He has promised to do for all those who receive Christ as Saviour. And God is, God is just by applying Christ's payment for our sins, recognising that the sins have indeed been atoned for by Christ. Now, 1 John 1, 9 does indicate somehow forgiveness is dependent on our confessing of our sin to God. How does this work if all of our sins are already forgiven the moment we receive Jesus as our Saviour? Now, what Apostle John eh, is describing here is relational forgiveness. Now, all of our sins are forgiven positionally the moment we receive Christ as Saviour. This positional forgiveness guarantees our salvation and promise of eternal home in heaven. Right? So this is positional forgiveness because of our confession of Jesus as our Saviour. The moment we confess, we have this uh, positional forgiveness by God of our sin. Now, when we sin, we grieve God. So Ephesians 4.30 says, uh, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. While God has ultimately forgiven us of our sin that we committed, there is still, you know, result in a blocking or hindrance in our relationship with God, right? Imagine a young boy, you know, who sins against his father, for example, stealing mother from the father, right? Father will be angry when he found out, eh? right? But a godly father will not chase the son out of the family just because he stole his money. Right? He will forgive his children no, unconditionally. Right? At the same time, the son will not be able to have a good relationship with the father until the son confess his sin of stealing the money from the father and apologize to the father and promise to the father that he will not do it again. Right? But if the son Second time, still steal the, mon the money, eh? Go, that the father will be very angry, isn't it? isn't it? So, likewise, in our relationship with God the Father, when we sin, we make a commitment that uh, we will not commit the same sin against God. All right? Okay. That's why we need to confess our sin to God whenever we are aware of uh, any unconfessed sins, not to maintain our salvation, but to bring ourselves back to a good relationship with God the Father, who loves us and has already forgiven us. And this is relational forgiveness by God. You know? Relational forgiveness by God after we have confessed our sin. Now, now, for forgiveness of sin by God, eh, there must be genuine repentance. Repentance not to repeat the same sin. And this is a process of sanctification which is maturing spiritually in holiness. We should try not to commit sins related to the Ten Commandments. Right? We should not worship other gods, you know, what the Ten Commandments uh, forbid us. Eh? We should not worship other gods, we should not misuse the name of God, we should not dishonor God, but we should honor our parents. Right? We should not murder, commit adultery, steal, or give false testimony against anyone. 
we should not covet anything belonging to others. Eh? So all these are mentioned in Exodus chapter 20. Eh? Now in the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus spoke about the spirit of the Ten Commandments. Right? Jesus said, if you are angry with your brother or anyone, you will be subjected to judgment. Just being angry, you can be punished by God. Right? Anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. All right? Anyone who knows the good he ought to do but doesn't do it, sin. This is mentioned in James chapter 4, verse 17. Eh? For example, to help the poor and the needy, as Jesus mentioned in the parable of the sheep and the goat eh? in Matthew 25. And we are not to oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor, in Zechariah chapter 7. All right? So the alien in our context will be the immigrant workers, the, you know, those who came to Malaysia to seek asylums and so on, right? So we hope that the enforcement uh, personnel do not uh, mistreat them, right? Can we just sin all we want then? Hebrew chapter 10 eh, says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deed. Right. The sacrifice Jesus has made should motivate us to avoid sin and live a life that is pure because we want to reflect the character of Jesus more and more. We need to be more Christ-like. Eh? So, in summary, Jesus died once for all for our sin. And it was a one-time payment by Jesus for our sins, including our past sin, present sin, and future sins. And justification for forgiveness of sin is only for those who believe in Jesus as Saviour and who trust in Jesus as the master of their life. All of our sins are forgiven positionally the moment we receive Jesus as our Saviour. And this positional forgiveness guarantees our salvation and our eternal home in heaven. Relational forgiveness by God happens whenever we confess our sins to restore a good relationship with God, right? And the sacrifice Jesus has made should motivate us to avoid sin and live a life that is pure because we want to reflect the character of Jesus more and more. Amen.